Cyberpunk 2077 has a lot of hidden details, and over the past few months we've been going through many of these encounters to find that actually a huge percentage of it is all connected. Indeed, by taking time to read shards especially, we can learn that many of the characters cropping up in these random encounters actually connect to other gigs and scanner hustles, which themselves connect to other ones and so on and so forth. But there's still a ton of hidden secrets and connections left to find. Encounters which either reference larger events in the game, wider pop culture, or just serve to be downright creepy, slash sometimes funny. So strap in and get ready to uncover another five hidden secrets and treasures in Cyberpunk 2077. Ready? Then let's get to it. Starting things off, you'll want to head down into the southern badlands until you arrive at the Rocky Ridge region, about 100 meters south of the melee weapon vendor. Here, you'll find a collapsed cave entrance, as well as several wraiths who apparently met an unfortunate end. If we open this Arasaka labeled crate, we can learn what happened to them, and the tale may sound somewhat familiar. Thomas Starr is a Militech engineer whose convoy was attacked whilst crossing the desert. He was taken prisoner by a band of desert outlaws, in this case wraiths, who demanded he built them weapons. Specifically, they wanted small light missiles. Of course, Thomas isn't stupid. He knows that refusing to cooperate will spell certain death for him. However, he also knows that completing the job is gonna spell certain death too. So what does he do? His life's work is now in the hands of these murderers. Is this how he wants to go out? Is this the last act of defiance of the great Thomas Starr? No. Of course it's not. By day 5, Thomas is already working on an exoskeleton at the same time as doing the work for the wraiths. By day 11, the skeleton is ready and Thomas begins work building a suit of armour, iron armour to go around it. And by day 36, it's also hooked up with flamethrowers and a power supply. The results are pretty conclusive. Thomas torched the entire place, collapsed the tunnel and no doubt blasted off into the desert to be rescued by Militech. And searching the surrounding area, I was pleased to find no corpses lying about in a cyberpunk version of a Mark I Iron Man suit, which is a nice change, seeing as these encounters normally end in tragedy for everyone. But I think there might still be slightly more to this one, specifically who arranged the capture of Thomas in the first place? Who is the Obadiah Stane in this scenario? And if the box labelled Arasaka is anything to go by, I'm gonna guess it was them, being Militech's biggest rival and all. No doubt now Yorinobu is yelling at all his inferior engineers, asking why the modified Militech suit isn't ready for them to use yet. After all, Thomas Starr was able to build this in a cave. With a box of scraps. Final question for this one then is what did Thomas Starr go on to do? Was he an instrumental part of an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people to see if they could become something more? Or maybe he just, you know, bought a caliber and spray painted it black and stored it down in a tunnel somewhere up north. After all, we know from finding Merkman's shard that his parents were murdered. And wouldn't it be fitting if Thomas Starr's parents had also been murdered back in the day by a man with a metal arm? Okay, I think that's just about all the references I can glean from this one. On number two. Venturing into southern Japantown next to a little assault in progress down here. Take out the tiger claws guarding this crashed vehicle and we can learn just how it came to be crashed. Indeed, this guy that was trapped in the boots will not only provide us with a perk shard but will also help answer a very big question in this game which absolutely nobody was asking. Toru Inagaki had clearly pissed somebody off since they'd put out a contract on him and it was only a matter of time before a merc showed up just like we have plenty of times ourselves, incapacitated Incapacitated Taru and carted him into a boot to be delivered to whichever fixer sent out the hit. Except, in this instance, the Tigers were able to track their guy down before the courier could reach their destination. The results are evident, and by reading the second shard on the driver, my perspective on delivering targets to fixers alive was changed forever. Seamus Sawaki is complaining to a fellow driver, Mike Martinez, a potential reference to Pondsmith and David at the same time, that Mercs really don't think things through when deciding to not just take out their targets then and there. They say not only is the idea of bringing in the target alive pointless because they're gonna die anyway, but it's also super dangerous for the drivers. And as a player whose perspective on the entire world is literally just what's being rendered at that moment, I'd never really considered this wider implication. Of course, carting bodies around NC in the boots of cars is a risky activity, obviously. Like what if they got pulled over? Just because that's never something that's happened to us doesn't mean it doesn't happen to others. 
others. And in Seamus's case, the fact that the Merc chose to bring the target in warm proved fatal for Seamus. Now, apparently, these cars come equipped with jammers, which again makes sense, but for some reason, on this unfortunate occasion, Seamus forgot to turn his on. So, next time you're carting a target away alive rather than finishing the job yourself, spare a thought for the guy in the driver's seat. Up next, we're heading down again into the Badlands, this time just between the Solar and Biotechnica farms. This building is unmarked, but has quite the disturbing tale to tell. It's pretty heavily guarded though, with both turrets and mines which have been keeping people out for seven years, as we'll soon find. Inside is first a terminal, with a communication between a health expert and Patrick Whitwer, the guy who lived here. He's being told that he needs to come in to update his heart valve, since the warranty on it only lasts for four years. It's now been Six. But Patrick objects, claiming simply that he can't leave and needs to be here. Why is this? Well, finding the now deceased Patrick on the floor, we can learn exactly why. See, back in 2070, as the unification war was winding up, people were leaving Night City in their droves, anticipating war on their doorstep and wanting to get to safety. In fact, this leads into why Pacifica is such a shithole and why Dogtown is now controlled by Colonel Hansen, something I'm sure we'll get lots of expansion on come Phantom Liberty. So, Patrick, see seemingly has a moral obligation to go and help the refugees fleeing to Southern California. What he finds, a couple months later, is a woman named Jane. And in his mind, the way he means to help her is by kidnapping her and locking her up in his basement. Jane, you see, had hired a smuggler to cross the Badlands and escape the shelling, but of course, the guy abandoned her and her group for dead out there, simply taking the money. And it was during her attempts to return to civilization that Patrick took her in his car and brought her to this place. A truly terrifying prospect, but it gets worse. Patrick's diary then jumps forward by two years, where he now claims, quote, Jane isn't so nervy anymore. I think she understands we should spend our lives together, end quote. Clearly, after two years, the woman is disassociating and going insane. Jump again to 2074, and Patrick decides she needs friends, at which point he goes and finds Tony, a guy who split off from his camp trying to reach Night City. Instead, he got Patrick at his campfire, who, after drugging him, trapped Tony as well in his basement. And after four years down here already, Tony confirms that Jane has indeed gone ratchet crazy. According to Patrick though, she isn't bored anymore. Fast forward finally to November 2075, and Patrick reports feeling, quote, short of breath again, weighed down like everything's so heavy, end quote. And indeed, we can infer that his heart valve failed shortly thereafter, leaving Jane and Tony down in the basement to starve. Now, from the fact that these cuffs are right next to Patrick's body, I'm gonna guess that maybe Patrick was planning an actual trip to get his heart valve checked out, and might have been planning somehow to bring Jane along for the ride. Then again, perhaps he'd simply decided that they would both go when he goes. Either way, it's an incredibly disturbing one, especially considering that it's a random unmarked building out in the Badlands that you can only find by just stumbling across. And it kind of does make me rethink leaving the city for a life in this lawless expanse. After all, it's just one wrong move and you can wind up with six years of hell down in this guy's basement, or perhaps even worse. And in fact, just as a little bonus to this one to show you that this is even more common than you think. Right over to the far east amidst the miles and miles of wind turbines sits a broken one with a tiny bunker. A much smaller operation than Patrick had going on, but a remarkably similar one. It's the same story, practically. With guy rescues woman and traps her underground with him, failing to understand why she sees him as a captor and not a saviour. In this instance, the guy reckons the second she left the bunker, they would come for her and kill her. And to be fair, maybe there's some truth in that, what with wraiths around. Still, very screwed up to be trapping people, even if that is the case. Seems this time though, Nicole, as she's called, managed to take the guy out by spilling some chemicals, but they apparently killed her too. What's most weird about this one though, is that the guy looks just like Patrick. So maybe there's just a look that crazy desert guys who kidnap women tend to go for, or maybe some Biotechnica clones who all have the same mental defects escape from the lab. Anywho, point is this is a pretty common occurrence out here, so be careful.
Over into Little China next for another small encounter relating to Max Jones, an independent journalist whom we'll meet for the Freedom of the Press gig. Max is one of the few journalists determined to deliver the actual truth in Night City, and his current focus is on bringing to light the corporation's utterly atrocious treatment of their retired vets. The likes of Militech have been claiming back cyberware from their ex-soldiers and using legal loopholes to get out of retirement packages. For this encounter, we'll find a guy named Hunter Highland, who was preparing to give his testimony to Max, despite the dangers this would incur for him. Hunter, you see, worked for Kendachi, predominantly an arms manufacturer, but apparently one which provided military support during the corporate wars in Southern America. When Max hits him up, asking to talk off the record, Hunter agrees, claiming he's never spoken of the atrocities the corpse forced him to commit during the war, but has now realised he can't keep silent on the matter. Not anymore. After all, the guy fought for them, and for what? Now he can't even afford to pay his rent. What loyalty does he owe to the company? So he and Max meet, and this is where things start to go downhill. Clearly, Kandachi actually do keep tabs on their former employees, and Hunter soon realises that the emails between him and Max were intercepted. So Hunter leaves his sensitive files for Max to find, before then severing communications entirely. Though he does share one final detail before this, saying, quote, It's like watching a nightmare. We drowned those villages in napalm, and we made sure everyone was home first." End quote. Then, realising he was compromised, Hunter made ready to leave Night City, though sadly not soon enough, and we find him shortly after he's been taken out by two mercs, no doubt hired last minute by Kandachi themselves. Clearly, the corp will stop at nothing to keep their dirty secrets covered up. If you want another example, then head out here to the swamp region of the Badlands between the junk and the desert until you come to this small shack. The resident, another vet, is long since gone, but did apparently manage to take his assailants down with him. Not that it would have made much difference in the grand scheme of things. He, again, wanted to contact Max Jones, this time just thanking him for the work he was doing, claiming it meant the world just to hear that there were other guys like him, reminding him that he's not alone. Of course, all this inspired him to do was rig his shack to explode, no doubt taking him down and anyone who was coming for him. Still, it does highlight the importance of Max as a journalist and how he's one of the only honest ones. And this guy too left some cool shit behind, which I'd recommend carefully looting. Now, this next one I've included because it's just downright funny. Over in Japantown, right by this fast travel point, you'll want to come immediately left. It's right by the same building, in fact, as the one with the scab apartment which we fight our way through at the start of the game. But simply heading down towards the parking lot, you'll come to a blue van, smashed up for some reason, with the driver inside, named Max Corvin, having not survived. On him are some legendary tier shoes and an explanation for what happened here. See, back in 2016, due to outbreaks of bird flu, Night City exterminated all avian life within an 18 mile radius, and that's a rule that stays in place up until today. So when Max hits up a guy named Peter Quillock offering to sell chickens, it seems almost too good to be true, and Max claims he simply started his own little farm with eggs from the black market, claiming, quote unquote, it felt like Easter. Real chicken meat would of course fetch a pretty hefty price in a world where everyone's forced to eat synthetic crap from all foods and Max claims that the meat quality is damn near indestructible. Peter, at this point, seems almost convinced, just asking, quote, are you sure there's nothing about these chickens I should know? End quote. And again, Max offers nothing but reassurances, this time that they have a long shelf life, but can be pretty chewy. His plan is to take payment up front, then simply leave them with the van. Sounds to me like a totally above board, brilliant deal with no essence of scam whatsoever. So why would anyone in their right mind decide to take out poor old Max with the illegal chicken farm. Well, peering in the back, we can actually see some of the chickens which were up for sale. They're not quite moving, but they are very much in an alive pose still. Clearly, Max's plan was to rip Peter off with rubber chickens for a quick buck, or should I say cluck, and a good laugh. Not exactly the most daring scam ever pulled off, but a pretty original one, and kind of funny. Too bad Max's joke though ultimately had some fatal consequences for him. 
Now, let me know in the comments which of these five you found to be most interesting. Personally, terrifying as being locked in a basement for six years is, I'm pretty struck with how much anxiety I must have caused those poor drivers who had to transport all of the assassination contracts. And I'll be keeping my eyes peeled for Thomas Starr from here on out. Who knows, maybe he gets a cameo in Phantom Liberty. Anyway, this is but a small handful of the many bonus stories and little details around Night City, so you can expect a couple more where this came from before we get our hands on Phantom Liberty. For now though, as always, a huge thanks to the Patreon supporters, whose names are on screen now, for going the extra mile in supporting the channel. And of course, thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.